Hi, I'm Aviva Rumani, and welcome to episode 32 of Kindred Cast, Lion Tree's bi weekly podcast featuring insights from deal makers and thought leaders from the world of tech, media, and everything in between. On today's show, Lion Tree CEO Arya Borkov sits down with Josh Sapan, the president and CEO of AMC Networks, which includes brands like Sundance, IFC, WeTV, and BBC America. Listen in as he discusses the evolution of AMC from cable channel to content juggernaut, which is home to Mad Men, Breaking Bad, The Walking Dead, and most recently Killing Eve, which is literally killing it in the ratings right now. This conversation couldn't be better timed as the traditional media industry is on fire right now with a wave of M&A activity. Hope you enjoy. I'm thrilled to be sitting here with my dear friend, Josh Sapan, the CEO of AMC and one of the most creative people in the world of media. Josh has been CEO of AMC for over 20 years and stewarded the company to produce some of the most lucrative and popular television shows of the century, including Mad Men, Breaking Bad, and The Walking Dead. He also oversees IFC, the Sundance Channel, which is a deal that we did together, and the joint venture with BBC America. It's great to have you here at Lion Tree for this week's episode of KindraCast. I can't wait to talk about the industry with you, Josh. Well, great to be here, and thanks so much for the invitation. A pleasure, a pleasure. Josh is also, in addition to being creative, I find him to be one of the more interesting executives in media and one of the more funny executives in media. So hopefully we'll get to some good stories. Don't uh, raise the bar too high, <laughs> if you don't mind. <laughs> but before we kick it off on AMC and, and the industry overall, I read in your bio, that I didn't know this, that you have the world's largest collection of antique lightning rods. Is this true? Yeah, it's true. Yeah, it's true. Some of them are on apparently permanent display in the Franklin Institute, which is the science museum named, of course, for Benjamin Franklin, who mm-hmm. invented the lightning rod. Yeah. But how did this come about? Like, were you a kid or just a recent... Oh, uh... no, it's a completely serendipitous, and it actually isn't really science-based. I actually found one in a junk store and thought it was beautiful because it was... The term is industrial arts, meaning it was manufactured, and it has a sort of beauty, and it was manufactured in different pieces. Actually, I did really got captivated by the nexus of design and industry. And at the time, lightning rods in the 19th century, mid and late, the pieces were being manufactured by different companies, and they were being sold so-called door-to-door or carriage-to-farm by itinerant salespeople. And so it's a story of American commerce and American if you will, direct marketing yeah. and retail and industrial design. And so there they went up on farmhouses. It was really a sort of cottage industry that grew into a bit of an industry, but never consolidated, to use a fancy term, never terribly well organized. But I thought very sort of design driven. And so I got captivated by them. And they were cheap too. So they're not aggressively collected. Yeah. So I set out to sort of emancipate lightning rods and have them recognized by the world for their industrial beauty, I'd say in that arena, I have failed completely. <laughs> but did I you want to win a record? Did you want to have the world's largest collection? Or are, uh, you, no, are you ambitious that way? No, it was actually more mission-driven, which is why it's perhaps even more peculiar. I wanted the world to recognize their beauty because mm-hmm. they thought they were underappreciated. And so in my mind's eye, I would have collected all of them, all the good ones, and then had a exhibition at an art gallery, and then also increased their price and cornered the market. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, along the way, I decided that it was nice enough just to get as many as I could amass that I found beautiful and then have them exhibited in a museum. How many do you have? So I have over 100, which makes it the world's largest, which yeah. is a pretty easy uh, place to get. To. Do you collect anything else? You don't have enough time on the podcast. <laughs> Save you and anyone who will listen to this from my answering that. Wow. We'll have to track to get a book of world records. <laughs> Going back to the, the answer business. is a quadruple yes. Yeah, I have a lot of collections. Yeah, sounds yeah. like it. Um, we'll have to do a Kindred yeah. Cast Part 2 good, on your collection. Good, good. 20 years ago when you became CEO of AMC, no disrespect, but the channel was kind of like black and white movies, sleepy programming, the beginning days of cable networks, etc. It's totally different now. So when you came in to be CEO, did you have this grand plan of saying, this is not what I signed up for, I want to make it colorful and creative, et cetera? Or did you say, you know, over time, we need to change with the times, et cetera? Because the channel has changed probably more than any other channel I've seen. Oh, well, thanks. You know, when I came to work there, which was a good long time ago, 
classic movies was a term, believe it or not, that was not in wide use. Yeah, American movie classics, right? Yeah, the term classic films was used by academics. This goes back 20 plus years, but the notion of preserving films and showing them in their original form and appreciating for all they were was not widely recognized. So I wouldn't knock the original proposition, which for its time was actually rather novel and somewhat revolutionary because it was about film appreciation, deep and serious film appreciation. The imperatives of business and consumption of media, however, changed pretty radically. And it's timely for today because movies at the time were becoming ubiquitous. Instead of being available only on a linear cable channel, you could get them on demand. It was pre-iTunes and it was pre-Netflix, but they were increasingly available. So the preciousness of having this lineup on linear television was not such a big deal. So it was really a business imperative, to tell you the truth, that led to the change in AMC as well, really from day one, we and I did have a picture that it could be a bigger idea than that and that it could take the essence of the beauty of classic films and move it to a broader media sort of invitation. But you're saying even then having black and white classic films was meant to be a differentiator. Initially, it was meant to be a differentiator. It was commercial free. In its early days, you paid for it. There were no ads on it. So in a certain sense, it's back to the future-ish when we talk about what we're doing with AMC Premiere because it was what was called a mini pay. And so we reorganized that, made it a basic cable channel, developed near ubiquitous distribution. But when I joined, it had uh, several hundred thousand paying subscribers. Hmm. And that was the business. Yeah. At that time, it was probably easy to get distribution, right, on cable channels and cable distribution outlets? Much easier, yeah. There was a paucity of offerings, relatively. Video prices were rising. It was pre-internet, so cable bills were lower. So it was, I would call it the salad days, if you want to call it that. <laughs> exactly. yeah. When did you start to put your creative expertise and your kind of insatiable appetite for the new and exciting content into the channel strategy? Sure. That was early on in a complete abysmal failure when I joined. I did an inexpensive show. It goes back more than 20 years. And I had had a notion this may be appreciated only by older people who are listening. And there were a series of talk shows that used to be on television. They were quiz shows and they were competition shows. What's my line and to tell the truth? But they really weren't about who won. They were about how well you talked. It was about being a rock hunter. <laughs> and so they would have people with patrician sort of manners of speech, and they would be charming. And so we developed a show called The Movie Masters, which lives in the legions of extraordinary embarrassments. The Movie Masters was a movie quiz show about movie trivia. And we actually gathered up some of the people from that era and Put them on. So the grand ambition was right there. The resources were not quite there. So how long did it last? Not very long. <laughs> it was pretty short, short lived. Yeah. Well, from that to Walking Dead, how yeah. long did that take? Probably the arc of all that was about a decade because yeah. we needed, frankly, the threshold of distribution and ultimately ad support to make investing several million dollars in forty odd minutes of television economic to give it a shot. So we had to grow the distribution. And then as soon as we could, we ultimately were investing in pretty high priced dramas. The first one that really was full form was Mad Men. Right. Um, it was actually preceded by a mini series called Broken Trail that won also Emmys with Robert Duvall. But we got fortunate right out of the gate. We put on some stuff that worked really well. But Mad Men was relatively recently, right? It was only about 10 years ago? Well, about 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah, 10 years ago. So halfway through your tenure. So how did that come about? Because I remember that transformed the channel. Mad Men and Breaking Bad, Walking Dead, etc. That became a different proposition for consumers, obviously for your affiliates, etc. How did Mad Men first come about? To use the word strategic, it was strategically driven. We really mm -hmm. determined that the old proposition of commercial-free classic movies would no longer sustain. It was not differentiated adequately. Yeah. In truth, not an unfamiliar pattern for cable channels sure. or even for streaming media. services today for media. There's always an evolution of nature, hopefully based upon people, consumers, and hopefully based upon the market, and hopefully based upon some good judgment and business. So th the broad determination was we had to distinguish the channel meaningfully not on the edges. 
we made for us what was a big bet at the time, which was to basically say we'll spend that amount of money on an unlikely story. It's curious for me because I took the script to three people who I trust a lot, and all three said, don't do it, because... Because it was transformative for the channel or because the script wasn't good? They in thought, their mind. In their mind, they thought the script wasn't good, which is what everybody thought, because it read very quiet. Huh. It did read quiet, I believe, and it read the characters were remote, which they are on screen a bit. And as someone said, who I trusted, Teflon, mm-hmm. it seemed sort of caricaturish, not very character rich, which is Matt Weiner. You can tell me credit. who they are, by the way, because they're saying bad things about you. <laughs> they're, no, they're actually good. They're <laughs> personal <laughs> friends. I wouldn't want to name their names. <laughs> but, you know, the, so, but, but we saw something a little different. In it. We yeah. did. And by the way, I credit to my colleagues who were championing it as well so i think when a business goes through a transition even in that way where the programming changes and you said it's not around the edges is that something that you're comfortable with as an executive overseeing a business that has to jolt into a new dynamic yes you are i am and the controlling shareholders of amc networks are the dolans yep and they have in their history a complete appetite for boldness complete boldness and risk. They love to jump. Hopefully it's a guided jump, but they do love to jump. Mm -hmm. We've had a lot of, for us, in our scale, jumps. And you feel there's a certain element of protection and safety because you have a controlling shareholder as an executive to make those leaps and make those changes. Absolutely. I would say that they probably encourage it and believe that the bet and the big bet is a better way to go than the small incremental safe bet. So it's the perfect environment to do that. And we don't talk about the swings and the misses. Those are unknown. We bury them. Yeah, of course. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) For your temperament, though, even with that protection and that encouragement and that boldness and that jumping, I mean, it is unsettling to see media businesses going through such a transition. Today, the status quo is not going to work, right? So you're always thinking about how to be in motion. Yes. And that can be exciting and exhilarating. I think we all want to be in businesses that move, right? That's how you create value, ultimately, if you get it right. But also it could be you wake up on a Monday morning or Tuesday morning saying, oh, I can't just do it business as usual. It would be great to have some stability here. How do you deal with that temperamentally and and how do you manage the business that way? So quite a relevant question today, probably for you too. I asked for a reason. Yeah. (laughs) The temptation to mourn for uh, a sort of industrial America or a media landscape in which distribution or paucity of opportunity is what you traded in Mm -hmm. and sort of exclusion of options was what you traded in Mm -hmm. is an easy invitation. Like it used to be this way. Right. It's a lot less invigorating When the alarm clock goes off, that may be the moment when you think, it used to be easier, it'd be (laughs) nice if we could just run that playbook. You know, I think by the next 45 minutes, it's a lot more fun to say, so here's the new plot, here's who we're up against, here's what people are doing, here's what technology is driving, how can we figure out what to do with content, what to do with interfaces, what to do with the way people are really consuming, what to do with people who are younger and different, have a different disposition, and how can we come up with something that serves them magnificently and makes hopefully a fortune along the way. Yeah. So that's just irresistible if you like that sort of challenge, which I think Arie Burkhoff seems to like an awful lot. I do. Lion Tree was mm. born out of this transformative environment. Not because of us, but because of the industry at large, media or finance. I like that dynamic because you're kind of indexed at volatility. Right. And then you have to kind of play forward. Yeah. So if I were to bring it to our company, I would say that we were a cable channel company. That was how we were born. And we have redefined ourselves, I hope, as a content company. And we've gone through evolutions of the revenue mix. We were very different in our constitution early on. And so today in our $3 billion of revenue, which is mid-cap, I think according to experts like you, but in the media landscape, smaller because the- Boutique-like. Boutique-like because the players are coming so big. The interesting issues for us are how to turn that into a strength. And so what we've done is our now revenue composition is approaching, you know, sort of half a billion dollars in studio owned TV show revenue. We used to be an American company. We now have more employees outside the U.S. 
in Europe and Latin America than we do in the U.S. So we're international in our constitution. And mm-hmm. we now have streaming services that are ad free, which are embryonic, but growing handsomely. So outside of the main business, we've diversified. And so advertising, which is probably among the most fragile parts of what we're doing today, two thirds of our companies now not ads revenue. And so that provides a lot more stability in our distribution and content sales and cable, so-called or pay TV distribution, is very strong and growing. But all this is meant to say that you are more in control of your own destiny than you were in the past or more diversified towards that goal. We are, and hopefully playing toward the future, 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 future. So we didn't used to own games. We own games. We mm-hmm. didn't used to own IP. We yep. own IP. Yep. All that stuff. Yep. You recently hired or appointed a woman named Jennifer Caserta, Caserta right. as the chief transformation officer of the company, which goes to our conversation about businesses having to be in motion and AMC having to constantly reinvent itself. Is that foreshadowing future transformation, or is that to kind of oversee what you've already changed? It's both, but more the former, because we think that the need for us to behave differently and think differently will be ever more urgent. Mm -hmm. And it can't be rhetorical. And if you're used to running a certain playbook that was based on principles of old, the ability and the willingness to change and to do things very differently may not be apparent. So it's good to have a person who can guide you to create all the muscles to do that. So she is an executive who succeeded admirably operationally in our company. She ran the IFC channel Mm -hmm. very, very successfully as the president of it. And so she recently agreed to move into this role, which is really designed to reorient the whole company, not on a static basis. And it sounds conceptual, but I think it's rather important to keep saying, what's next? What's new? What do we have to be ready for to take advantage of what's going on next? Yeah. I'm assuming... It's hand in glove with you because a lot of ways you're the chief transformation officer and allocator of capital and risk to make those bets, right? That's right. It is hand in glove. Mm -hmm. Great to have somebody who's focused on how the company is set up, who we're recruiting, how we define talent, if you want to call it that, who's in our company, what type of people are there, what they're thinking about, because we don't have that many people, a little over 2,000, but there's probably the next great idea down the hallway in some person who I may not know all that well. And we want to make sure to find that person to come forward. That's how we try to be structured as well. The idea generation is the most scalable function of the mind. There's no cap on it. One person can have unlimited ideas and it can come from anywhere. Right. Full meritocracy. Just to take off on that, I was in a meeting yesterday. I can't share the idea, yeah. if you don't mind. We had a business problem. We were in a, it's called investment committee because we've done a some M&A, and made some investments of mm-hmm. late, some smaller, some larger. And so I took the opportunity because we were talking about gaming and a game company, and we had an incumbent, more regular issue before us. And because the people in the room were so smart, I just said, by the way, can anyone think of anything new about how to approach this, which has been intractable for us? And one of these people who has the title Innovation lived up to the promise because he said, yeah. Well, do this. It related to our app, to tell you the truth. And I don't spend enough time on our apps because I watch more regular TV. And he said, so take the app and do this and this and this and this. And then that's a root in. And actually, it blew me away. It just this happened two days ago. It just blew me away. It wasn't even the idea that matters. The fact that the process was so strong. Yes, right? right. And so I'm actually going to collect. I have to figure out the formulation of it right now to get more people like that person together to figure out how to address things that they're not floating up in their consideration immediately. Because I think a lot of the problems to solve are apparent, right? It's not difficult to identify the issues. It's difficult to find the solutions. And so I think when everyone's thinking about the same issues to solve for this industry, and specifically for AMC, then everyone's in a level playing field. And then the premium is on who can differentiate themselves on the solutions and the ideas. Yes. And that becomes the metric by which to judge your people because they have the direct opportunity, meritocracy, to transform the company and transform the industry. 
we used to figure out, I think five years ago, well, this is the problem. No, no, this is the problem. No, this is the issue. Not enough scale, not enough boutique, you know, things like that. Now I think people understand the basic issues, you know, pay TV trends, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now it's about like having the right people in the room to help solve the problems and create a different dynamic. How do you make meritocracy occur? Because I've just been thinking about it of late in the last yeah. two days. I hope it's an okay subject because yeah. it's really been on my mind. I used to think that meritocracy was the be-all, end-all, meaning that anything could happen at any level so to speak, and oh, we should break down all barriers of traditional structures. And then I realized that you also need some structure around a meritocracy. Like you need some systems in place. Like you just had a, a meeting where you put the problem on the table, right? So you have to have a forum for how to um, encourage the idea. So we do like a brainstorming session and say, okay, this brainstorming session has a specific topic in mind. There's a meritocracy in this room. But when you come out of this room, you may still be missing other things that you need to know about, like analytics and corporate finance and knowing how to do an M&A deal, et cetera, yeah. that you need to be trained. That meritocracy doesn't transfer right. into other areas right. where we're going to put you on the front lines or we're going to send you out to see Josh Sapin and present your ideas yeah. tomorrow and you're still a little green because that idea has to have a certain um, safe place to it internally and a certain structure to it. I like managed meritocracy yeah. over time. I've learned that. And I constantly try to get better about how to manage meritocracy, how to manage period. But I do believe fundamentally in giving power to the corners. And I think that's where the gold sits. I don't think the gold sits in the middle of the box because that's the herd and that's conventional thinking. And that could be right, but not always going to be the most profitable ideas or the most interesting ideas. I think the gold sits on the outer edges of the box. So I want to find them. But to make that the norm takes a lot of structure. I would agree with you. I think you said it very well. Thank you. Let's keep uh, making each other better. You know? Well, you know, the thing you just said, a lot of talk about organization, but the term dynamic teaming. The notion is bring new people in to solve different issues, make it solve a specific problem, which does, I think, inherently create equality, meaning you leave your title so-called at the door. Right. When you're working on something and all ideas are a little bit equal, that's not very hard to manage because it's sort of organic if there's something that you have to get over very yeah. quickly. And then the issue is just, as you said, how to organize after that to make sure that it's functional and yeah, you can you actually know, achieve. I think the equality point is a great one because um, embedded within that is self-awareness and self-corrective behavior. You don't want to force corrective behavior, ideally, but sometimes managers have to do that. But otherwise, you prefer people to be self-aware and self-corrective, and that's all about getting back to an even playing field. When you come to our conference, it's not by accident that the first thing we do is have someone that's really interesting and powerful above the fray of media speak, like Madeleine Albright this yeah, last year, right? Yeah. Because then everyone in the room just gets to a level playing field by true. virtue of looking at that one yes. person and saying, wow, I really can be inspired by them, that person. And when you get to the cocktail hour right after that and you spill into the room, there's no ego in the room. It's connective based on feeling that we all are the same in some level. And then from there, we can start to really get some texture and some closeness. There's a little bit of inspiration that comes from that. And there is a sort of democratic instinct in the best sense, little d, that comes from either a bigger idea or a so-called bigger person like Madeleine Albright. We have started bringing people in to talk to a few hundred of people in our office. And we just had important actors and creators and producers. So Hank Azaria came in two days ago. And in our case, content or product, so-called, is really at the core of what has led us to where we are and will lead us to where we are. And he is sort of inspiring, if you want to call it that. Yeah. And this woman, Caddy Kay, who's on BBC America and has written a bunch of books, came in and they were, when I say extraordinarily well-received, better than just nice job, it was a recollection and a point of reference about what we fundamentally do, meaning great shows, great stories, great people, great actors, as opposed to the possibility of getting lost in the process and lost in the numbers and lost in the business. It creates a reference point, which is where the greatest strength is, which is in the stories that we tell. It's very helpful. It's, it's actually very helpful. pragmatically helpful. I mean, it's money helpful, ultimately. Correct. I think it's all about whether it's being inspired by a Hank Azaria or a Madeleine Albright, or it's being self-corrective to the point of understanding what we're all dealing with or it's um, realizing that there's a heaviness around the world at large. And that's not just a political comment, but the industry is going through some massive yeah. changes. We all have to 
move ourselves back into the down to earth where we come from <laughs> once in a while in order to then reset the bar to then say, okay, well, who can take us further ahead? Because if the bar is always high, then you know it's a very difficult way to manage and produce and outperform. And I think the bar is high sometimes because you know we have an inflated view of our talents. I spend a lot of time trying to think about relearning things that I um, thought I knew and for the benefit of trying to get something new to aspire to and to manage towards. Sorry for my um, No, it's actually, you know, <laughs> I, I can trail off on that. It's actually rather important, you know, this Saturday night was the Peabody Awards. And so we were fortunate enough to get a Peabody Award. We've gotten a few of them. Congratulations. Yeah, it's a wonderful thing. And we got it for the show Better Call Saul. So it really belongs to Vince Gilligan and Peter Gould, who created the show and the characters. And so we get to roll along. And we've gotten them for Portlandia and other shows in the past. But Peabody is really not Emmys. It's not about glow and glamour. It's actually about great journalism and great storytelling. And I, I hope this is relevant because they gave a Peabody to the company, Mr. Rogers. I don't know if anyone remembers Mr. Rogers' of Neighborhood yeah, of course. on PBS. Anyway, if anybody listening has a moment and interest in this subject, he was the subject of a podcast that I listened to. And on the podcast, they had a recording, which I later found in video, when he, Mr. Rogers at the time, was seeking public funding from the United States government for his show. And so he went before U.S. Congress. And it's a wild moment when, you know, he has that almost awkwardly straightforward delivery. That's not a made up thing like, hello, children and all that stuff. You know, he actually talks that way. Mm -hmm. You sort of think he organized himself to talk to children. That's the thing. He talks. He's before the United States Congress and he's directly soliciting for money and elected representative is sort of being very unwelcoming and saying, you know, the government doesn't need to give money to goddamn television. And Fred Rogers, I think I have his name right, right? Mr. Rogers essentially says in that same voice, he creates an appeal about children and the wonder of children and how they learn and what he's trying to teach them. It's so straightforward, you almost don't see it today. It's without irony, it's without cynicism, it's without self-consciousness, and this would never happen. It was like a stage dramatic moment. And the representative says, basically, you've convinced me, it's done. And it was just this wild moment. And I point it out only because it goes to what I was mentioning about Hank Azaria. I don't know if it relates to Madeleine Albright, but certainly for us, the essence of content and the power of content and the formulation of content, and you have to construct it properly, but it's curious about how well you do if you can reference it and make it available in a way that connects to people very pointedly, uniquely, because there's insane power in that. And by the way, just to make that pragmatic, in today's world, what we're seeing and this is a much more business comment, is the power of intellectual property, the power of IP. And you see it in the manner of rights being sold in television, who's on first. You see it in the abundant monies being paid most recently by the streaming services to people who've got the ideas. And hopefully you see it in our relationship with the BBC where there's tons of great, wonderful IP and just how powerful that is. Well, that's where your pride point is, it seems like, as a company. You believe in the, we call it IP, content, whatever it is that you're creating, you believe in its purpose and therefore has a right and a obligation to be viewed by the masses, right? But a few statistics here. Yes. I mean, the cable business is becoming more challenging. Audiences are eroding with things like cord cutting, et cetera, and obviously people watch much more video online. Cable channels have lost viewership. Audience migrate to online platforms, Netflix, we all know the story, et cetera, right? So you have to find new ways to get your content to the audience directly while you have a relationship with the cable operators who are your friends, my friends, et cetera. But it's a challenge. It's a slog, right? Sure. So how do you break through other people's gateways to get to that audience? What's your Mr. Rogers moment? Yeah. We who are you to, talking to? Even? Yeah, well, we sort of have to walk and chew gum. Yeah. And that's okay, meaning that we have our base incumbent business in the United States, which a significant part of our, our financials rely upon. Just to say it simply, and we 
have affiliation agreements, we have people watching us and we sell ads, and that is a fundamental part of our business that is our top priority in our relationship with distributors and consumers. Which so, means you want to preserve it as long as you can. But we want to actually lead yeah. it. So right now, just to get very specific, video prices are coming down in different options, and we've set ourselves up, I hope, well, because we're in essentially every skinny bundle in a preeminent position. On the virtual MVPDs, we're carried in more of those than any other independent programmer. And it's not because we're nice guys or we sell better. It's because the five channels that we have, only five, are known and named the shows that are on AMC and Sundance Channel and BBC America and IFC and WeTV are known and named. People have relationships with them. And our cost structure for those five and the manner that we've organized them to sell them to the pay TV industry, so-called cable industry, makes us the lowest priced package of channels from any multi-channel offering that a retailer, satellite, MVPD, or cable operator can buy. When people say, how do you make it into the skinny bundle, Josh, AMC, you're not broadcast, you're not sports, you're not events, right? How do you make it in? It's because of what? Here's the answer. If I'm the person who has to sell the skinny bundle, if I'm the marketing manager of the skinny bundle, somebody has to do that. Someone's doing that for a living, right? Mm -hmm. How many subscribers do you have, Josh, who bought the skinny bundle? The single best thing to do, I really believe this, to get sales in the skinny bundle and maintain margin is to put AMC networks in it because you're spending less money for it. You have four of the top, 10 shows on cable television dramas. And so you're getting the stuff that people want at, frankly, today, the lowest price. So if I have Better Call Saul and I have Preacher and I have The Walking Dead and I have Fear the Walking Dead and I have Planet Earth and I have Blue Planet 2 and I have Brockmire and I have Killing Eve and I have Love After Lock, all these things, and I've paid less for those channels, then I've done the smartest thing to advance my subscriber base. It's really quite simple. Yeah. So we just have to be structured properly for the time. And I think we've put ourselves at least in that fundamental position. Yeah, because I think consumers don't necessarily want a skinny bundle. They're not calling for a skinny bundle. They're calling for quality content, flexibility, and price. Yes. Ultimately, which is what people usually point to a consumer of wanting, right? That's what you offer. It is what we offer. We, by design and degrees of serendipity, are at the right place at the right time. And I say mostly by design because we resisted some of the temptations, if you want to call it in the past, for so-called easy money, when people were proliferating cable channels that really didn't have much of a purpose, but were opportunistic and could get carried. And so we didn't put ourselves in that position. We actually maintained a sort of degree of, if you want to call it, principle about good content, good channels that were really worth it that people wanted. So, yeah, they want what they want, and they want it at a fair price, and they're exercising more power. Right. So unbundling is a positive for AMC. So to date, it has advanced us. We grew subscribers over the past year when nobody else grew subscribers. Mm -hmm. So that's Mm -hmm. a rare thing to be able Mm -hmm. to say. And we're proliferating in these virtual MVPDs, which is... A competitive landscape. As you said, it's not an easy world. So on that part of the business, we're actually flourishing. Yeah. So we've talked about this a lot over the years. Do you believe in scale? Do you think scale is important? I think it's become a reference point today that is probably or perhaps provides some insurance if you like insurance policies. So it's not to be discarded. I don't think it's an answer, actually, to an issue of whether people really want what you have and whether you're adequately adapting to a changed landscape because you can just put companies together that make them bigger, that make you feel better, and make are sort of safer. It may give you 12 months or 18 months of... Comfort, there's nothing wrong with that. That's Mm -hmm. pragmatic. I don't think that the way scale is being implemented today is necessarily answering a more fundamental question, which is what are you actually going to be not when you grow up, but what are you going to be when you're even adolescent? Meaning it's going to be upon you quickly and you better have the right configuration and the right stuff 
if you just have more of the same or you haven't answered that question, then you'll erode from a bigger base. Yeah. So, and we've seen those examples abundantly through time. You're a student of the media consolidation history. Uh, I would ask you whether you think they've worked or not. Well, I think what you're referring to is defensive scale versus offensive scale. Yep. Right? Defensive scale gives you a moat of protection and economic power, of synergy, et cetera, around you to have excess capital and reinvest it, et cetera, have a big brother mentality to it, quote unquote. Offensive scale means that you're changing fundamentally the strategic position of your company and you're allowing the ball to move down the field in the sense that you have A, capital to invest in new areas, B, a new business models to create and C, like new ways of reaching the consumer, et cetera. I've seen both, right? Defensive scale only works when things are uh, bad because you want protection when things are bad. But it is a hard place to manage from optimistically, right? Yeah. Offensive scale is much more exciting in the sense of you have to really think through what are the right matchups for the future. And who knows what the future looks like, but I think it's very compelling and exciting to think about what the asset profile of the media business looks like in the future optimally. Does vertical integration matter where you have a cable operator owning a channel? Do the technology players have a business owning content and the right kind of content? Yes. Global um, is a part of the business model that you've already implemented, diversifying around different regions, not just because of defensive purposes, but because there's opportunity there. Netflix has done that beautifully. I mean, I don't think Netflix gets enough credit for being global. Yes. Right? I mean, I asked Reed the other day, like, what the toughest marketplace he has to deal with, and he says, Indonesia. That was his answer. You know, we're talking about challenges in the U.S., right, whether it's business or regulatory, et cetera. He's talking about Indonesia as being, at a CEO level, the challenging dynamic for him, right? So that just speaks to how well diversified the business is globally. And so I think there are all kinds of ways to be offensive about scale, but you have to pick it right because uh, these are risky calls. I don't think these are deals around benchmarks or templates. You know, it's interesting, Ari. I was just thinking about when you asked the question about scale, we and I have been asked through the last, let's call it decade, but it goes back, the following questions chronically at various points. Ten years ago, there's MVPD consolidation. There used to be 20 operators that made up 80% of the United States subscribers. Now there's probably four. How are you going to live in a consolidated world? Won't you get killed, AMC networks? You're going to be killed. Following that, you're separating from Cablevision when you spun. You no longer have a cable company, quote, to protect you. How are you going to live? Mm -hmm. The third question, Mad Men and Breaking Bad are iconic, historic shows. They're coming to an end. How are you going to live? Right? And I mean it. I mean, people thought, how are you going to live? And so we weren't brilliant. We just did what we did. So against our size, it was eight years ago, we spun from Cablevision. We were about a billion. Yeah. So three times the size of the revenue, the EBITDA two and a half times, and now we're overseas and have a studio and have BBC America and Sundance. And so the world is different. Well, I think that speaks to culture and idea generation, things we've talked about for a reason here, because the wall of worry is always going to be there. And how you pivot off of that and respond to that, it's not by accident that you're living still. It's because you take those moments of being fundamentally at risk, not bet the company at risk, yeah. but if you wake up in the morning and say, man, like I have some challenges to deal with, and then you convene your group and you put it into the walls of the company, like how we transform ourselves. Yes. Right. And how we constantly move. That's why I started asking you about black and white films, because yeah. it's not just a normal migration of a business. It's a forced migration Absolutely. of a business. And I think that's what is not often discussed about this industry and about you and about AMC, because, of course, you can point to the challenges that exist today. And like I said, those are known. But do you point enough to the culture of reinvention that exists at AMC or at the company and say, I give them credit for being able to do that again? Because there's something about the way that they manage the business or family controlled companies in certain cases, or just the way that you're thinking about yeah. these challenges and where your ideas come from. And you take some risks. Yeah. Right upon us now, I mentioned IP, we went global and you referenced it in your earlier comment. And I do believe the answer ultimately. And whether you should get credit for that, you would know better because you're a genius of the equity markets. I'll take whatever you say for it, but I wouldn't mind some credit. Kind, yeah. No, I'm quite serious. 
But we've also set up streaming services because the most fragile part of the economics of this system today is the ad revenue, certainly for us and others. And so we now have five different ad-free subscription services. The most interesting genetically is AMC Premier, which is on the Comcast Xfinity platform, just rolled out on MVPD, will soon launch on YouTube live. And I think we have in our sites other distribution and subscribers to that are growing. It's an ad-free version of AMC within the ecosystem. Mm. All sorts of interesting opportunities are occurring as we deploy that with Xfinity, with our partners at Comcast. And then we have made small investments in streaming services, Sundance Now and Shudder, which we set up ourselves. So we have the tech and we have people out of our office doing that one. Mm -hmm. So we didn't essentially predominate the culture of what we thought needed to be startup-like. So we put it off at WeWorks and it's growing handsomely. And then we made an investment in a company that operates Acorn and Urban Movie Channel and two streaming services, and they're growing handsomely. And we've just got enough scale that we're starting to produce TV shows for those subscription-free streaming services. So it's a whole new horizon. And they've now launched, talk about Indonesia, overseas. So so Shudder is now in the UK and in Germany and mm -hmm. in Canada. And so we're running that down. And boy, that's fun. Yeah. It's really fun. That's great. Yeah. I really applaud your stewardship and leadership and creative engine and expertise. And um, I can't wait to see where you're going to go for the next 20 years here. Oh, well, thanks so much. Thank you, Josh. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Pleasure. I hope you enjoyed our show today. If you want to check out any prior episodes, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Feel free to leave a review there as it helps people find the show. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at KindredCast for behind the scenes photos and info. Keep listening and see you next time. Audiation.